So, um, let's talk about the core. Core of the cow system. I didn't know how to word this. Here's, I need like a better name for this. I was like, like my introduction to my system, my fighting game system, part one. But like, I feel like that's just so extra. Let's call it the cow system. <laughs> Into the mind of a cow lady. I like that. This sounds like a best selling novel. Basically, I almost, I follow this train of thought in almost every fighting game I play. If I go from like Guilty Gear to Street Fighter, I would do the same thing, or I'd think the same way. If it was like, you know, to Dragon Ball from Guilty Gear, whatever, like, I will always follow this sort of principle, unless specified otherwise. Let's talk about, I always, I always talk about this a lot, but the chivalry system. AKA the grub quote mentality. I like thing, I like calling it the chivalry system. I want like a history channel, like get, Get one of those British dudes who always does the, like, the documentary series, you know. This cow lady has been net playing for 14 years. Like that, you know what I mean? That's what I need. Basically, what this tends to be is encouraged form of restraint is usually what it, it boils down to. A lot of people follow this system. I guess it's, it's really just encouraging holding back. But basically, like, it's things like, you know, you throw too much. Here, oh, this is a good one. I won't do this because it's scrubby. Hinder their own improvement or their own, I guess, success. If people use like the chivalry method, tournaments would be meaningless. A lot of people view games differently. Let's say like COD. Some people view COD and they think the absolute limit of like what the game is, is you just shoot. You just shoot. If you view it from this lens, there's not many ways there's to improve this unless you change your mental. Whereas if I thought of COD, I would think more more about strategy to get to your kills. These two differences are very minuscule, right? But these are actually gigantic differences. These two players that think like about this game two different ways, these players would be hugely different. The reason why is because one is a lot more direct and just like accepts the game as like, basically it's RPS is how they view it. I'm not gonna say, basically they view it as unstable. Whereas things like positioning to get your kills, you use context from like your teammate dying in front of you or stuff like that. What I would do a lot, and this is this is my tactic, I had a friend, like a buddy system, with, until someone was like, you just can't behind this fucking idiot. Just move out away from him. <laughs> and I didn't even realize like I was doing that. I was like, oh, it's just like, I, I'm trying to survive. <laughs> I'm trying to live. The complexity of it varies per person, how you digest it. But ultimately what matters is that you often optimize every tactic for it. The reason why it's important, and you can see this in this sort of context, if you don't do something beneficial, someone else probably will. The reason why it's important to have an open mind is because of things like this. No matter what, you're not going to be able to have a very, I guess, general perspective on what happens if you refuse to accept that there's more or less to a game. Usually though, if you accept that there's I guess more, you're more likely, of course, to become a better player. So really, I mean, the, the main goal, the number one goal, be open-minded if you actually want to. Improving is the utmost goal. A lot of people, when I say this, they're like, bruh, what the fuck? The reason why is because a lot of people immediately just assume winning is the goal. A lot of people actually, what they mean is this their brain tells them it's this. In fact, like, I've, I've, I've thought about this a little bit. I would, like, if I had to really make an assumption, and mind you, I'm not a professional in any way, improving is the actual action. Winning is Im an implied reaction from improving, right? This is almost like skipping a step. A lot of people would find it weird that I would say that I would rather improve off of a win grand finals than actually win the tournament. And I think that's a good sign of how I disagree with a lot of modern, I guess, perspectives on fighting games. A lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves to win. If you've ever excelled in something, there's always gonna be a pressure where, like, you have to keep up, almost. A lot of people aim while learning fighting games. Uh, number one, they pick up the game, have fun, right? I call this the innocent thing. Number two, you could say they get better, start understanding what's going on, more expectations, but having fun. It's over. <laughs> I don't have a name for this, but they get much better and become noteworthy. I should say notable. No noteworthy sounds weird. Expectations get put on them, starts having less fun with the game, 
and more fun with the status. Big fish in a small pond is very common in fighting games, I think. Some people view COD, right? Gun shoot. Some people view COD. Move around, fight in advantageous positions, and shoot them. There's so many ways you can do it. But I mean, ultimately, it's the same game. The reason why is because ultimately, there are a lot of kind of micro ways you can optimize your gameplay. Uh, a good example is like, Sometimes, and I'm not joking, some people quite literally can understand neutral better by dashing two character lengths instead of three. Not a lot of people tend to actually get neutral. Basically, winning is the reaction of improvement. No matter what, you can always improve through micro situations. Is the win the results of several improvements snowballing on each other? Typically, yes. That is usually how it works. Interacting with your opponent is essential. I shouldn't even say essential. It's actually not optional. You know, fighting game interact. Not like, oh, I have to talk to you for 15 minutes on the phone. In the context of the most fucked up mix up, it will boil down to, you know what I've been waiting, you know I've been waiting to say this. You can use it to your advantage to get rewarded for no action. Because you're always playing with a human player, no option is consistently dominant. No matter how good your option is, if you literally only press far S as, let's say, like, you know, Ram or 5H, I mean, you'll fucking die, right? You can always just beat them. Things with like jumping over, with punishing. You can optimize it by choosing the highest damaging route possible rather than... This is a great example of how some people actually do this without thinking. They'll play against someone that does the same exact thing over and over again and just like, oh, well, I'll just counter it. And then they may like be like, well, they're only doing it, so I'll just optimize a little bur like, a little further. I've done this in, in actual matches when I was new. Almost every move will have a weakness. Obviously, some moves have more weaknesses than others. The best option is constantly moving. This changes a lot with things like risk reward and RPS. Can you believe that we've not even gotten into risk reward or RPS yet? Every character has a habit or kind of like a learning pattern. Ram will probably use far S. You know, Anji wants to spin. Nago has low blood, he'll probably be able to. A lot of these, you have information based on the character they play. Because of this though, it creates a weakness. You get matchup knowledge by playing against other people. I mean, most every Everybody knows this, but that's actually how you are basing all of your strategies and all your thoughts off of it, right? So it's up to you as a player to adapt and interact with their playstyle and knowing what both your character's strengths and flaws. It sounds more complicated than it actually is. So like, let me give you an example. There are two types of ways people interact. Focusing on character-based matchups, there is the player-based interactions usually means representing enough options to overwhelm them or prey on bad habits. Um, some players do both. Some players focus primarily on one of, over the other. Basically, these are one of the most common ways that people do it. It's, for example, a more traditional matchup-based uh, risk that you could view as a little more based on like risk reward. Uh, I should say low, low risk reward varies typically. You could think of it, I tend to view it as like the more like kind of static response where it's like, okay, this is the established counter. This is what you're gonna do. There's a reason for it. That's it, right? The player based one is a little more like risk varies, reward varies, but there's a chance they may not be ready. I mean, Renault throws a great example of it. There are players that essentially focus on one over the other, or some are really good at focusing on both, like I said. This is another problem with also improving in fighting games, because you can't always tell like which is which. Like, is this a matchup-based interaction, or is this a player-based interaction? Which also makes discussing matchups and things like that also difficult. You need to understand that you can play in any way you want, because there's a human nature to it. You can prey on opponents' weaknesses that they don't get, or you don't have to even do that. You can win based on, like, pure fundamentals sort of thing, like much more focused on like the general interactions and neutrals. But you need to understand there is a statistical preference. There's always a statistical preference in terms of risk reward. So today, I said today we're going to get into risk reward, but you can take these risks anyway, and you can be successful, but you need to take ownership. A lot of people will be like, oh, like I, I did run up throw from full screen and they pressed 2S and they weren't even really looking for it. And I'm pissed and I'm going to do it again and I'm going to keep doing it. And then they keep getting 2S and they're like, well, this person sucks. They're just pressing 2S because they don't know. Like, they're, they're not really looking at the screen. Risk reward, RPS, because are the two most important parts of the game. Should I explain this further? I feel like <laughs> I feel like I've done a lot. And I shouldn't even say this is not even relevant in just fighting games. 
right? In all, almost in all competitive games, they use risk reward in some way, right? If you are the most fundamentally sound player in existence, and you're playing sick food, you know, footsies, the big kick, big punch, whatever, right? If you just run up and VP mindlessly over and over again, just because like inherently the risk reward is pretty terrible. The end game goal of again most competitive games be consistently good. It is a important benchmark. You ideally want to maximize your reward for the least amount of risk. Personally, like I believe that the end game goal of fighting game is essentially tipping risk reward to a point where your opponent ends up taking risks for you. If you have someone just like whiffing buttons in front of you just because they're like so afraid, right? They're taking a risk. Every time they press a button, they're taking a risk. You can just whip them. Stuff. This example is, I think, very good for demonstrating the importance of risk reward. Some people may just panic. Player A just runs at player B. Player A assumes from now on player B will just run at them mindlessly. Player A starts swinging buttons and going ham and just whiffs everything. Player B uses the threat of running forward as an option to whiff punish player A. Player B got an advantage by doing absolutely nothing in that interaction. This is how, this is essentially, this example is almost a golden example of how I view what the end game goal of fighting games is. If I see an interaction like this, I'm like, that's, that's fucking checkmate. That's night. No matter what reward you get from this, right? No matter what reward you get damage, right? Inherently, it's like almost a positive. The thing is, you didn't take any risks. You didn't do anything, right? Like you just, you used a threat. So let's say player A, Hill Sage 420 is their name. The big kahuna. It's actually their name. Just runs at Benedict Z is their name. Bit of it, Z, I'm gonna just call them Z. Expects them, kill Sage 420, the big Gatuna, to just keep running at him. Holds his ground and does nothing. Kill Sage 420, the big Gatuna, starts, but either way, like they basically start a block string and start their turn with no reaction. This situation is not necessarily a loss for, but a Z. The reason why is because one, to even start this RPS, Kill Sage still is taking kind of a risk to approach. It's a lot different than using an established threat and keep doing it compared to establishing a threat and pulling away from it, right? There's a big difference here. One of the other reasons why this is noteworthy is because the outcome is still different, right? There's no room for error compared to first interaction. This interaction, in a perfect world, they will always whiff punish them. There will be an exam. I'm not joking, by the way. There will quite literally be an exam at the end of this. I'm not joking. What if What if I had a Cal 80 school certificate? Could you imagine if, if I sent you a, a certificate, you passed Cal 80's RPS school? When I typically discuss RPS interactions, when I'm, what I mean are both players are recognizing the rotation of options. I mean, that's literally it. It's just a guess. But it's a guess based on information. It's an, it is an educated Yes. Linear RPS. Linear RPS is basically a direct coin toss. So think of it as like, you know, on wake up, you either bash or block. Actually, I think that's great. That's actually a good way to put it. It's, it's quite literally just that. The situation doesn't develop past initial threat, but the reward, of course, varies. Does not mean something bad. Stop thinking that. The reason why I separate this from, I guess, complex RPS, but I usually just call it RPS in general. I usually just specify it. Uh, a good way to view something like this is like Anji. Like Anji's Fujin, right? Fujin has a lot of ways you can deal with it, right? A lot of weaknesses on follow-ups, but you usually have to answer it correctly. The RPS develops as the set goes on. It's like one of those sort of things. It can constantly develop and change. Linear RPS cannot change. It's always just like a coin, a coin toss. You can use risk award to minimize linear RPS, but it varies. Risk award is almost 
essential for a strong strategy here. So this is one of the best ways to actually kind of like tell if someone is super familiar with RPSing or not. Usually a lot of people are really good at forcing linear RPS, but they're not so great at complex RPS. You have to view it from the lens of like, you know, what do they get after that? In fact, that actually leads me into my next segment, but I'm, I'm going to stop for now. But then next time we're going to be talking about reward and what that what that kind of means. I talk a lot about direct reward, but I don't talk a lot about, about reward from like the situation that follows. You guys, you guys want some like homework? Try to play while constantly thinking about what your opponent is doing and what you expect them to do. That's your homework. I would love it if you posted how this went for you in my Discord. Can you imagine that? I'm actually giving you homework on Christmas or on holiday break. It's my, it's gonna be my Christmas break. But...